So I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, today we're going to be talking about rapidly iterating on microservices using Docker, Kubernetes, and Node.js. And I think about a quarter of the talks at this conference are some permutation of this title. Um, so narrowing that down, what we're going to be talking about today is specifically the developer ergonomics around developing microservices locally as a developer. How can we make this approachable not only to ourselves, but to our entire team? And what do I mean by that? <clears throat> so, in order to explain why we need developer ergonomics around microservices, we first have to explain why they're painful to work with in the first place. Like, show of hands, who here has worked on a system that's had more than one service? Uh, cool. And was that a painless experience? Cool. <laughs> so when we're moving into the era of our microservices, um, there are some really cool benefits that we reap, one of which is you can have these nice little compart or compartmentalized um, reusable components, um, and we're seeing the rise of these super hyper-specialized systems like um, graph databases, RabbitMQ, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we can just pick these up, throw them into our applications, and they work amazingly. Um, but for the average app or, um, or stack that's built using microservices, you may have five, six, seven services all intertwined for a single logical application, um, which is what we're seeing on this slide here. Um, and what that ends up translating into um, is for me as a developer, I have to now take on the burden of maintaining all of those er systems, making sure they're up and running, making sure I have the appropriate versions. The readme for these uh, repositories generally have like 12 or 13 steps just to get up and running and starting the application. And by the time you're done with that readme, your desktop looks something like this with terminal windows, where you have like 15 of them open all over the place just to get the application up and running so you can run NPM start on your specific application. Likewise, for the rest of your team, you now have all of these independent systems. And for us as Node developers, we have a package.json. Um, C developers, they usually check the our libraries in and they use make, um, Ruby gems, et cetera. But for services, the overhead of maintaining the versions, making sure that those uh, databases, dependent services, their state is in a pristine state where your application can actually use it, make use of it, um, that burden now falls to us. And it actually we don't do a very good job of maintaining this ourselves. So and on average team, what we end up looking like is we have four different versions of Node across four different developers. Somebody's still using the version of Postgres that they used at the job before this with all the tables still left, or left over. Um, <clears throat> some people are running Debian, the little neck beard in the corner there. Everybody else is running OSX. And then we have Ubuntu out in production. And for our team, the phrase works on my machine is becoming very commonplace in pull requests. So there has to be a better way. And what we really need for our services as we move towards this bright new, well, not so new world, um, but commonplace world, um, what we need is a way to declare our service dependencies um, explicitly alongside the project, not just declaring them in a readme, but declaring them in some sort of um, the equivalent of infrastructure as code, but for local development. And likewise, we need a single point of entry for our products. So as developers, we're very used to that. Um, for our applications, we always have a single like point, like in point of entry. We run make run or make build, and our application starts up. So really what we need is we need a package.json for our services. And that's what today's talk is going to be about. And if you want to follow along, hop onto GitHub, retrohacker slash presentation. All the code that we're going to do or use today is up there. Um, I want to put a big asterisk, or asterisk on the side of this. This presentation is not like gospel. It shouldn't be considered a playbook. It should be a conversation. This is one proposed way of addressing this. Um, don't just take this verbatim. Go home and like implement it for your team. You'll probably, everybody's project is a special snowflake and you're probably gonna run into the rough edges here. Um, so reach out to me. I'll, my Twitter handle will be at the end of this presentation. I'd love to talk to you about how like this paradigm can work with your team. So, oh, that's the end of the presentation. So we're actually gonna jump down into code. So what we're doing here, um, we're gonna build a simple Express application, and all it does um, at the beginning when we break ground on this project is it's going to respond to any HTTP request with hello world, nothing special. But we're also gonna build some structure around this application um, so that our developers don't have to worry about the version of Node they're running, they don't have to worry about how the tests are run, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, we're going to take, or we're going to accomplish this using Docker, and then we're going to treat Docker as an implementation detail, and we're gonna push it below a single point of entry so unless you're actually interacting with Docker itself because of the way that you're trying to change the code base, you don't have to worry about how it's running, how it's set up, et cetera. You just have to have it installed locally. So what does this look like? So specifically, <clears throat> we start off with, um, oh. Yep. 
I said failed me. Um, so we start off with a single point of entry. In this case, we're using a make, or a make file. I like make because it's malleable enough um, where I can make its output really pretty. Um, but you can use just about anything you want and whatever is natural for your team. So NPM, et cetera, et cetera. As long as there's a single point of entry for your project where your readme isn't this like the gospel where you go there to figure out how you're doing everything, there should be a single point of entry. And I'll show you what that looks like. So uh, presentation one. If I run make, so for this project, oh, that's way too small. For this project, when you run make, it tells you how to interact with the project. It tells you the available commands as a developer you can use to get the project up and running. So if I want to run make test producer, what this will do is it'll build the, or the uh, what this will do is it will build the uh, test defined in test slash index.js and run it against the code base locally. But for me and my perspective, I don't have to worry about do I have node installed, do I have the right things installed, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, if I want to see if I have the right things installed, I run make depths and it checks my system locally to make sure that I have the proper dependencies installed. In this case, it's checking for Docker for this example. There'll be more later on down the line that it'll check and enforce to make sure that they're there before actually running this code. So it'll be self-correcting for you as well. So I run make test producer. What it's going to do is it's going to go through and it's going to build the Docker images for testing our application. It'll do an NPM install, which I was not expecting for it to do, and it's pulling this over my tethered phone. So that's my data bill for the month. But um, so while it's doing that, let's go down and actually look at the Docker file that it's building. So what we do here, and who here has used Docker? Show of hands. Fantastic. So what we do here, and it's very er, standard, we're using the base node, uh, public node image uh, node for, um, we're just doing an NPM install inside of it, um, and this is the actual image that we would ship to production, um, which we will do here at the end of this presentation. We will ship this to Kubernetes. Um, so this is just a standard Docker file, and then on top of that, we do this thing, uh, I call it linear inheritance for Docker files, and essentially what I, or the, what, uh, the practice that I enforce when doing this development um, is that, uh, or this pattern in development, is that Docker files will never branch out. So what I mean by that is that you start with the image that you're gonna ship to production, and as you need things on top of that, you build images that inherit from there. So what we see here is we actually inherit from the other image for our tests. We set the, our node environment to dev, and then we do another NPM install to put all of our dev dependencies on top of that, and then we run NPM tests. So what that does and what that means is our NPM test, um, it's running in the same exact environment, not a replicated environment that, uh, of the image that will be shipped to production. So the image that we're testing is the same exact thing that goes to production with extra layers is put on top. So we have a strong assurance that if our tests pass, what's in production will also be stable. All right, so it actually ran. Um, so what happened here is it spun up the test, uh, spun up um, a uh, inside of the, uh, our, so, so what this did was a full-fledged unit test, spun up the app server locally inside of a Docker image, um, ran super test against it. Nothing special. And if I do make, run, we'll also spin up a server, and it didn't have to repo that time, thankfully. And there's hello world, nothing special. So where we can get uh, fancy with this, um, once we have a Docker file and we've Dockerized this, uh, pro or this uh, application, we can then also define a Docker uh, Compose file. And we can use Docker Compose on top of this. And Docker Compose allows us to do essentially what we do with Docker Run, but define it, like declare it in a uh, YAML file. So what we're doing here is we're defining a single service, or it's the producer application. You build it using the uh, um, Docker file inside of the local directory producer, and when it spins up, it, it's exported on port 3000. Um, when you run make in this directory, you now have make run, um, and also you have this new thing called make test integration. And that's where this Docker, doc, or this Docker Compose YAML file starts getting really interesting. So here in test.yaml, Oh, I do not want to write that change. Um, <clears throat> so here in test.yaml, we also spin up a second service. And the service, it's extending the previous pr our producer de our declaration. So we have a producer image that's spun up. We can actually run our unit tests inside of that image using make test. Um, but what we can also do is we can define another integration service. Um, and this integration service is an integration test. 
and it spins up alongside of this image locally. So I can run my integration tests locally using the same exact Docker image. And if you can see, I actually provide the producer host and producer port. So the same exact Docker image can be pointed at my local image or my local Docker image. And then later on, when I get further down the line of development, I can deploy this out to production. I can change out those environment variables and I can point it at my production application and my, integ or my integration test will run against that as well. So now I now have a reusable component that I can use for my integration tests and I can lay this on top of my local development or my application stack locally. And now what's great about this is if I run make integration test or test integration, I only have to have one terminal window open. It's going to go through and, uh oh. Aha, I did not kill the process over here. Much better. I run this and it's gonna run them both in the same terminal window and we'll see both or the output of both the integration test and the server itself. So we saw producer one spin up, the integration test run, and it uh, simply the integration test just hits the HTTP endpoint, checks to see um, if the super agent test passed. Um, this is pretty much just copied and paste code from the uh, unit tests, um, but swapping out um, local host um, or actually the express app being dropped in for the URL that we passed in via environment variables. So now we're running integration tests against this. Stop these. All right, and now from here, we can actually start installing our dependent services. So somewhere we read on Stack Overflow that you should never serve HTTPS data from Node, um, and you should be caching all of the Node requests for static content um, because Node's not great at static content and not great at crypto. So we copied this from Stack Overflow, we drop this into our project, and then in our YAML file, we're gonna look at our test.yaml file from now on, but it's also in run.yaml. <clears throat> we are, are in our, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in our YAML file, we dropped uh, Nginx in there. And I'm not sure if you guys have ever set up Nginx locally for a project, but it took me about half a day the first time, and then about three hours the next time, messing around with Debian configurations locally on my laptop to get things up and running. Um, and then every time I revisit it and I need it for a new project, um, making sure that all of the other configurations have been cleared out for other projects and making sure that that shared Nginx for my application locally um, is in a good state. I, I, I waste a lot of time doing that. For this project, um, it required six lines of YAML, and I had a fully dedicated Nginx instance for my application that I could get up and running with. And that's what we're gonna do. So we're gonna run make, and in this case, I can run make test integration. And what this uh, Nginx configuration is doing, while well, that starts up, is it's uh, a simple proxy cache. Um, so it's doing things like, if I have, yeah, I have gzip turned on, so it's doing gzip compression for us, um, and it's caching all requests to that endpoint. And when we run it, we'll see that uh, we run, it should return hello world, and it did. Um, and then we run it a second time to test the cache, and we got it back. And nothing special is happening here yet because this is still a really simple app. But what we've done here is we've done integration tests not only on our application itself, but we've done integration tests on our application and the Nginx configuration that we set up to front that data. So now we can actually do integration tests across our entire service locally on a single terminal window, run everything up and get a response back. And we see we got an exit code of zero from that uh, container. So we can actually put this into a Jenkins configuration or a Jenkins test, put it out onto Circle CI, and we can actually use this in these integration tests in our CI CD pipeline. And we all or we have this with like 20, 30 minutes of sitting down in front of the keyboard. So let's stop all these. And now this is where things get really interesting. So we also read that we shouldn't be doing our logging directly from the, or the node process, and we should probably push that off into some sort of message queue. So that's what we did. We have this little, oh, that's consume.js. We want index.js. So we create this application, simple, tiny little microservice, and all it does is it does a console.log um, when a request comes in over RabbitMQ. And producer, we've changed from just uh, sending the response. We're also now calling log and that's publishing to RabbitMQ. So when a request comes in, it hits the endpoint, we publish out to RabbitMQ, and then on the other end, it gets pulled off of a queue, and it just gets written to standard out. And now our integration test. What we've done with our integration test is now we can test the producer 
and now we have actual output from our service. We can test the Nginx fresh, so making sure it actually falls through Nginx sets of cache, and then the second time we can test to see if the Nginx cache is used. Um, what we're gonna use here is just visual verification, so the test will run, we'll see if we see output twice for the Nginx, and if we do, it's not caching, um, but it's super trivial to do this and actually do, um, ver or to verify that the Nginx cache is being used and it's not hitting on the other end, especially when you start piping this into something like um, an Elk stack. Um, you can have watchers in your Elk database um, whenever some, or whenever the Elk database gets touched, you complete the unit tests running in the integration tests. Um, and you can do all of that at the integration test layer. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna run make. We now have make test all. Actually, we don't have test all. Make test integration. And now while this is running, what we're essentially doing here is we're gonna spin up our integration service. We're gonna spin up Nginx, RabbitMQ, um, and now our integration service is gonna go through, it's gonna hit, and we can see the first time that our integration service, it hit the uh, endpoint for our application. Um, oh. It should have. Connected to RabbitMQ, and our service did not output. Nothing. Bear with me one second, sorry. So we'll run through, and right now our integration, or our uh, consumer is not reading from our queue. So our integration tests work. They proved the thing doesn't work. They caught the problem before it shipped, cool. So we're not gonna solve that up on stage, um, but what we are gonna do is we're gonna move forward, and from there, now we have our integration tests, we have everything in place. Um, we're gonna take that same exact app, we're gonna ship it to production now. So we have our integration tests running locally. Um, so essentially what we're doing during this talk is we're setting up a foundation for a project to build on top of. Um, we're putting all the CI CD in place, that's or all the CI CD tests and everything in place that's necessary to verify that the code base is working, and then we're wiring it up so that we can actually ship to production. So what we see here inside of this make file, we now have added a deploy statement. And deploy will push our local or, or configuration out to Kubernetes. So what we've done is on top of our Docker Compose file that we wrote before, On top of the um, Docker Compose file that we wrote before, we then put a uh, Kubernetes manifest that does the same thing, but for a Kubernetes cluster and defines all the extra stuff that you need for like load balancing, et cetera, at the Kubernetes level. So this is our Kubernetes uh, manifest. We're not gonna dive too deep into what this is up on stage. Um, in fact, I'm not sure if I've ever written one of these from scratch. Um, most of this stuff is just reusable components that you can copy and paste between your projects. Um, but there's really nothing special about that file. But what we do is we do a make deploy here. It's now going to take, and we've already set up our cluster. Um, the make file will actually do that for you too. So as a developer, if you wanna stand up a new cluster in your own private account or a second cluster away from production or away from staging for you to just play in, um, the make file will let you do that. We've run that before we were on stage because A, I'm tethered and B, it takes a while. Um, but what we're doing now is we're pushing out to production and I am now realizing that we're also pushing images across my tethered data connection, which is gonna be fantastic. Will this work? All right, while this is running, um, does anybody have questions about what's going on up until this point? Because this was relatively quick. Good? Cool, so while this is running, we'll jump ahead, we'll see if this actually pushes. I have very, I pushed them before I came on stage, but if the cache was invalidated, this is gonna take a lot longer than I expected. Um, so let's try to kill this real quick. And we're still doing okay on time. Oh, we're still connected. We're still hitting up. 
All right, so while this is running, um, we can look at a real-world implementation of what this looks like. Um, so recently, I've been working with a company called Storage. Um, and if you guys aren't familiar with Storage, they are a decentralized blob store. Um, so think of S3, but S3 meets, like it's, that doesn't quite do it justice, but think of S3, um, but where you as a user um, can auction off your own hard drive space. And then users who want to upload files, it's like a matching service. And then they do like cryptographic verification, breaking it up into a bunch of tiny little pieces, um, doing redundancy and stuff to make sure when somebody shuts off their laptop, your files don't disappear from the world, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, building out the Heroku, and so um, we, I helped them build out their Heroku integration, which is a real world implementation of what we're talking about here. So this integration is actually built through two microservices or two services. Um, one of the services is an SMTP service, um, which allowed us to decouple the logic from their, what's called a bridge service, um, where they do all their registration. So as a user, when you register for their service, you hit what's called the bridge, and the bridge sends an email to make sure that you are who you are. Um, but the problem with that is from Heroku, when Heroku registers a service for the user, you don't want to send off an email, because you know who they are. They're Heroku, or they came from Heroku. You have verified that user already. So instead of putting special little snowflake logic for Heroku into the bridge, we set up an SMTP server that intercepts that. So when you register a new account on a Heroku, you have your normal REST API for normal Heroku integration. Heroku reaches out, hits that API, that registers for you on the bridge, which sends off an, e or an email to the UUID for your add-on at heroku.storage.io which gets routed back to our microservice that's running the registration service. It intercepts that, makes sure the user is actually a Heroku user, and authenticates it. So we have an SMTP service intercepting emails to do auto registration against the bridge. And then we have another service, which is um, <clears throat> the actual REST API for Heroku. And what we're able to do is, this is a super dense Docker file, or Docker Compose file, but down here at the end, we can see a couple of things that we've done with, um, <clears throat> Docker Compose to allow for, sorry, to allow us to uh, do full-fledged end-to-end integration testing with code coverage um, across our array of two microservices. Um, so down here, if I can find it, links. So <clears throat> we have some code base, or like some, or some dependent services from another team, that is the bridge, and we don't have control over that, which a lot of us in our day-to-day -day were used to that. Mm -hmm. A lot of us were used to that. Um, so this dependent service is one that I pull in from GitHub. It's the bridge, and I can't really put code changes in there in order to like, make my integration tests work. So what I have to do is I have to do clever things like hire, or hijack DNS resolution so that requests to the bridge or out of the bridge come through our mock services and mock, our mock integration services to make sure that those work. So what we can see here, one of those is um, we have a Docker image or Docker container called Service Bridge Account Mapper Heroku. It's a mouthful, but that is our account mapper for Heroku that we spin up. <clears throat> and it's our mock Heroku, um, or it's the mock or Heroku API server for that. And using Docker links, we're actually able to resolve all requests to api.heroku.com to that container. So I can actually mock out the Heroku um, service that we don't have control over um, for a service that I don't have control over its code. All DNS requests that come out of there, I can intercept with my mock service and then or make sure that the, um, <clears throat> the integration test continues this, uh, uh, in normal fashion. So what we see there, if I run make, it then tells me I can run make test. I run make test and we'll go through, we'll build the images, which they're all pulling from cache. And what it's doing is it's building up or spinning up the SMTP service. It's spinning up the, or the uh, Heroku integration service. It's spinning up a Dockerized version of their bridge. And it's spinning up a mocked Heroku API and a mocked uh, Mailgun API. So we can mock sending emails. We can mock um, doing requests out to Heroku. And then we're using um, tape. And there's still a bug at the end of this where we've broken Istanbul. Um, well, broken NYC, the cover of, or <clears throat> the wrapper around in, or Istanbul. But what we do is we actually, we can uh, hit the endpoint. We can say, okay, from Heroku's standpoint, Heroku tries to register a user, so we can actually mock that with the integration test. It actually hits the real service that we've contained or put into a container, which tries to register on our Dockerized version of the bridge, which sends off an email in our integration test to our SMTP service 
which then reaches back out to our uh, registration service and completes the cycle, and we're able to pass the test. So we're actually able to uh, cross five service boundaries in our integration tests um, using a single um, tape test. And I can show you what that looks like. Um, test slash E2E slash index. So this tape test, what it, sim or what it does is it creates a uh, simple using the request library um, from Michael. It builds a request to, and you can see this with the Heroku ID, the Heroku password for our Heroku add-on um, with a UUID that we generate for this test. We hit that endpoint and we basically we pretend we're the Heroku service hitting our, our, our API. And then from that point forward, everything else is already pushed down to the Docker layer. We've containerized all these services and they're real services, and the only thing we had to change was DNS. So from us, on our end, all we have to check is to make sure that we hit this endpoint, um, make sure that we hit this endpoint, which is running locally on 8080 within the context of the uh, test. Um, we hit 127 with the port, with the request up here, which is the Heroku body request. And then from that point forward, everything is going through the normal services. And then when it responds back to us, we know if it responded with the 200 and that its logic was sound, which we test further down the file, um, we know that the service itself performed from an external perspe or perspective, from our user's perspective, as desired. And then we can push forward. So this lets us test the assertions about our application from the user's perspective um, with these complex microservice um, or microservice app or microservice-based applications. Cool. Let's try this one more time, and then we're gonna call it quits on Kubernetes if it just uh, stalls on us. It looks like it's gonna stall on delete this time. I'm still tethered. So I apologize, there is no Kubernetes push. Um, but at some point, I will actually put a video of this whole thing working on that um, repo, and if you take this home, um, all of these should work out of the box. Um, the GitHub repo that I linked in these slides, maybe, maybe? Yeah, the GitHub repo that I linked in these slides, this functioning code, everything I did up here on, um, the st or on stage, um, you can do on your own laptops. Um, run make depths to see if you have everything you need. Just install, like it requires G Cloud, install that the normal way. Um, and if you have any questions about it, or you wanna play around with this, open a GitHub issue or send me a DM on Twitter. Cool, I think we're good. Thanks, guys. Hi. Uh, so I'm uh, Dave Thompson, and uh, this is intro to React Native. Uh, my goal with this presentation is to provide an overview of the React Native ecosystem and hopefully get you to a point where you might be able to start using your web development skills or other native skills to start writing React Native apps. So just to get a, a quick overview, um, how many people use React and Redux? Okay, quite a few. So um, for those of you who don't know what the heck Redux is, um, it's the revolving duck simulator. And uh, this is a uh, command line duck hunt game. So this is what you've been missing if you haven't been using Redux yet. Uh, this is an app that I put together uh, using Node. And Node was really cool for me when it first came out because it allowed you to do things like interact with the file system and write real networking code that you couldn't do before with JavaScript. <clears throat> React Native is kind of similar in that it opens some doors. It allows you to do things like interact with native APIs without having to write Java or Objective-C or other native languages. So what exactly is React Native? Um, I've heard some misconceptions. Um, I've heard that React Native is running uh, React Web inside of a web view. It doesn't do that. Uh, I've also heard that React Native transpiles JavaScript uh, to a native language, that's not correct either. Uh, what it is, is it's a bridge between a JavaScript runtime and your native runtime. So when React Native starts up, it actually uh, spins up a couple of different threads. One of those threads is running your 
uh, native UI, and there's a JavaScript runtime that's being executed in the other thread. And they communicate with each other. So the React, uh, the uh, JavaScript thread might tell the native thread, hey, you need to change some stuff on the screen and update your view. On the other hand, the native thread might say, hey, we had just had some user interaction. You need to handle it. And React Native is the bridge that does that communication. How you create a React Native application is you create, it's composed with JSX elements, just like you'd create a React web application. And your JavaScript contains your state and your data fetching and any of your other business logic lives in your JavaScript. So Facebook officially supports iOS and Android. Uh, Microsoft supports uh, React Native on Windows, and there's also a community uh, support for Mac OS. So you can see it's not just mobile, uh, it's actually cross-platform for many different platforms. I really wanted to play around with the Windows one, uh, for, but I didn't quite have time, so we're gonna have uh, examples from iOS and Android throughout this talk. Uh, so if you've noticed, I've been changing slides with my phone, and that was actually the first uh, React Native app that I wrote. So uh, on my phone, I can see which slide I'm on, see how long I'm talking, and see notes for my presentation. And I hope that this is the kind of thing that you might be able to take away from this. Uh, find a project that is small enough that can, it can be completed in less than a week, but useful enough that you'll actually finish it. So just a really quick overview of React for anybody who, who's not familiar with React. Um, this is a React web component. Basically, you pass props into this function, and it outputs HTML. It looks very similar to a HTML template that you'd see in JavaScript. Uh, but the difference is that when props change, uh, React automatically re-renders um, with, the, with the new state. So if you have state A, and now you have state B represented by two different sets of props. Uh, React manages transitioning from state A to state B so that you don't have to write the imperative code to go from state A to state B. Instead, you just declare what state A and state B are, and React takes care of the rest. Uh, React Native component looks exactly like a React web component. Uh, in this example, this component uh, renders three different elements. It renders a view element, a text element, and an avatar picker. So view is basically the React Native equivalent of a div. Text is basically the React Native equivalent of a span. And avatar picker, in this case, is a custom component. Custom components in React Native can be composed either of JSX and JavaScript, or they can be a wrapper for an actual native widget living somewhere uh, in your code. It is native, so when you view, uh, if you make a form or something with React Native, your components are going to look native. In this case, this is a screenshot from Android, and you can see it looks like Android. If you do this on iOS, it'll look like iOS. Uh, and because of that, you might want to style your components, either to look different than the stock or just to give um, a better UX experience. React Native handles styles using a subset of CSS. You might call it CSS the good parts. Um, it uses only flex for layout, it's the only option, and it's actually a subset of flex. It's not all the options that you have in the browser. I've actually found it to be very easy to work with and have less confusion than the mass of CSS options that you have in the browser. You define your CSS in objects, and you pass those in to your components to be consumed. If you want to replicate the cascading nature of CSS, you can store these style objects in separate modules and use object.assign to merge them together in whatever way that you like. It's a little bit more flexible than uh, cascading, in, in fact, because you can control how it gets cascaded. If you want your app to look the same on different devices, or if you just want a place to start, I'd recommend that you look at an existing component library. 
Um, here are some native-based React Native elements. The amount of components out there for React Native is not quite as rich as it is for the web, um, but that's rapidly changing as React Native becomes more mature. So you'll probably see ex uh, additional libraries coming online soon. So one of the things you're probably gonna wanna do when you're writing your code is you're, wa you're gonna wanna do different things on different platforms. You might wanna do one thing on iOS and one thing on Android. So you can actually introspect your uh, system at runtime, which is what this code is doing. Um, it's checking to see if you're on iOS and, and checking to see if you're a particular version. But that's not a very uh, powerful kind of paradigm. And actually a more powerful paradigm is to be able to do platform specific builds. React Native uses um, ES 2015 plus some newer features. Um, so you're gonna be importing your code like you would in ES 2015. In this case, I'm in importing Avatar Picker, this component. And on my file system, I actually have avatarpicker.ios, avatarpicker.android, and avatarpicker.macOS. So when I run my React Native build, it's just gonna automatically choose the correct module for my platform, and it's just gonna be there. So there's no uh, runtime um, checking required. <clears throat> One of the coolest things about um, native is the, are the uh, native APIs um, that are exposed. So React Native allows you to call those native APIs from JavaScript. Uh, this is an example from Android. You can see the at React method annotation marks this method as being able to be called in JavaScript and inside we're using an SMS manager API to send a message. This is how you would invoke that code in JavaScript. You just import uh, native modules and call the function. Uh, React Native takes care of doing the type coercions for you for the input arguments and also the return values um, from there. Uh, of course, you're limited to, um, you know,